from the Squamish Chief. This is the Squamish Sound. I'm Keely Bartlett. And I'm Stephen Chua. This is the 32nd episode of our weekly podcast. You'll hear the story behind the story as we take you into the newsroom. We'll talk about what did and didn't get into the newspaper this week. On the show today, painting the town red this federal election, the liberals remain in power here in the sea to sky. That's how the grown-ups voted, but we'll also hear from local students. And a Squamish climber makes a first ascent of a new route after a life-changing accident. Finally, we talk to one person who aims to reduce the film industry's carbon footprint. So the biggest news this week was clearly the outcome of the federal election. It was. It was such a night. Tell Um, us about what it was like in the newsroom. I wasn't there, but you and Jen were there to the wee hours of the morning. Mm -hmm, The very wee hours of the morning. It was a very exciting race, at least for the first couple of hours, I'd say. So polls close at around um, 7 Mm o'clock. And so once they shut, the numbers start rolling in. We had a counter or a tracker or whatever you want to call it uh, give the numbers as they were coming in in real time. Mm -hmm. So we saw these figures streaming in throughout the country, and we obviously have one set up for our local writing. Uh, Say it again. The West Vancouver Sunshine Coast Sea to Sky Country Writing. That will be the last time she has to say it. Thank goodness. It's a long one. (laughs) (laughs) For a while. So numbers are streaming in uh, quite quickly, and... We were quite shocked at how close it was, at least for the first two hours. Mm -hmm. The projections um, have generally been a very strong liberal uh, outcome, which is what happened. But initially, it didn't look like it. The conservative candidate and the liberal candidate, so the liberals, Patrick Weiler, conservatives, Gabrielle Loren, they were neck and neck. They were Mm -hmm. within, um, at times, maybe 100 votes of each other. And it was like this for maybe a couple of hours. So, um, And 100 votes is really, really close for such a large riding. We it have a is. lot of people here who can vote. So to yeah. have that difference between 100 votes yeah. means that it could have basically been anybody's race. Absolutely. Um, at that point, so it wasn't 100 votes the whole time, but it mm. was it was fluttering between maybe 400, 300, 200, 100, 200, 100, like that kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. So at that point, two hours in, we're just like, okay, we might have to brace for a recount because this is getting really close. A little bit further, the liberals start gaining and gaining and gaining, and it becomes a very big lead in the end. Final count um, towards the end of the night was Patrick Weiler, the liberal candidate, getting 22,100 votes, approximately that much. That's roughly 35% of the vote. Mm -hmm. Gabrielle Loren, uh, she did quite well, but it was uh, not neck and neck. It was about 17,100 votes. Uh, roughly 27 percent. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, conservatives definitely put up a, a big fight, but in the end, they were bested by a fairly substantial margin. Uh, we did manage to speak with Patrick Weiler as he was uh, basically informed of the results shortly after. I'm feeling incredible right now. It's, there's just so many things that are running through my mind, and I'm just uh, I'm so thankful for all the, the amazing team that, that I've been working with the last especially the last few months and, um, you know, really grateful and humbled by, by the trust that, that uh, West Vancouver Sunshine Coast Sea to Sky Country is put in me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, a lot of people in Squamish are going to be wondering right now, uh, what does this mean for them? And, and I'm just curious to know what your plans for our town would be. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think it's uh, a little... A little early to say um, exactly what this is going to mean for, for any specific part of the riding, except that I'm going to be the absolute best representative I, I can be for, for the entire riding. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, what, what that's going to mean is, is making sure I'm, I'm engaging the best way that I can uh, with, with governments, with, with business, with, with civil society, and to make sure that we're moving ahead on on shared priorities and and really, for for me that's that's things like uh, affordable housing, uh, that's transit, that's uh, that's making sure we have we continue to have and we build up on a really strong plan to to fight climate change and um, and having really robust environmental laws. Pam Goldsmith Jones was our last MP in that case, and. Uh 
a lot of people um, may think that you have big shoes to fill. I'm, I'm curious to know what you would say to people who, who are used to dealing with Pam. Um, well, I, I agree. Those are very big shoes to fill. Pam was an incredible MP, mm -hmm. and um, and it's it's she's someone who's been an like a great mentor to me, mm -hmm. and that I've learned a lot from. And I think I think what's one of the things that's really made what made Pam so successful is someone who was a former mayor or two time mayor. She was so she was so plugged into to the entire riding and. Mm -hmm. and it's really important in this riding because it's it's a huge riding. It's very diverse. It's spread out. It's important that you spend the time to 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 be there and to be seen to be there, so that um, that very diverse concerns are being represented. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I can I I've learned a lot from how she's done that, and I really want to pick up on on exactly how she she went about doing that. Mm -hmm. And um, and and that's going to be the same thing to make sure that that. Um, that I'm there throughout the riding um, and making sure that, that people feel that they're getting great representation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, looking at the numbers, uh, you definitely had a, a win there. But I noticed that like the, the Greens and the Conservatives also had very strong uh, numbers, stuff that we haven't uh, quite... Uh, maybe weren't quite expecting. And I, I, I feel that a lot of it has to do with people feeling a little bit jaded with the Liberals uh, and maybe just changing vote. Uh, what would you tell those people who may have voted uh, Conservative or, or Green this time around, who would have otherwise voted Liberal? Um, well, I think, well, what, what I know is that, that um, you know, Gabrielle and, and Dana and and um, you know, and, and Doug and and uh, Judith and and Terry and, um, and and Gordon, they they ran really strong campaigns. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we, I, I think we would be really selling them short by by chalking it up in, in that way. Um, and I, I really would have been impressed by by how they've they've gone about things. And um, yeah, I, I, I that's that's kind of how what I would say. There were other candidates that mm -hmm. did quite well. The Green Party's Dana Taylor, roughly 14,100 votes. That's about 22%. Judith Wilson of the NDP coming in at 8,800, about 14%. Um, Robert Doug Bebb, People's Party of Canada, 983 votes. Uh, the Rhinoceros Party candidate, Gordon Jeffrey, got 206. And independent Terry Grimwood, Mr. Hubs Pubs himself, got 158 mm -hmm. And so, he was the last one to put his name forward in this election? Yes, he was. Um, a, a few notes that I thought were quite interesting. The Green Party mm -hmm. did fairly well. Um, I, I, we don't have a breakdown of how it is community by community. Mm. But I would imagine, I would not be surprised if the Green Party actually possibly even won in the Squamish area. Because mm -hmm. um, this, this is a... This is a fairly strong performance. It wasn't enough to really take the prize, but uh, the Green Party, like I still remember when they were just a fringe party getting like eh, maybe like a thousand votes, a hundred yeah. votes or whatever. This is a, they've come a long way, but it was certainly a big performance because uh, not too long ago, it would be inconceivable to have a Green Party beat an NDP candidate. Mm -hmm. Like that would be a, a big, big deal. So they've come a, a ways out. Um, another big highlight, in my opinion, NDP candidate uh, Judith Wilson getting 8,800 votes, 14%. The NDP declared their candidacy really late. Yes. Really, really late Super for a major late. party. For the major party, I yeah. think she was the last one to declare. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, not trying to knock on anyone or, or do anything, but the fact of the matter is a lot of people in Squamish felt that they just kind of weren't here. Like yeah. there was... Well, for our all candidates meeting, she had a ferry to catch, so she left halfway through. Yeah, she. So if anybody came in after that point, it would look as if she hadn't been there. Yeah. Um, so to get eight thousand eight hundred vote, eight thousand eight hundred votes, or fourteen percent of the vote, mm -hmm. uh, despite declaring extremely late and despite not really campaigning terribly hard, mm -hmm. or, or at least at in all. our area of the yeah. Um, and uh, when we got a hold of some of her comments through one of our sister papers, she was just like, oh, wow, this is definitely better than I imagined, given how, mm -hmm. much, uh, given how much effort we put in. Those are not, 
that's not verbatim, but that's overall the general sense of okay. what she was, of what How? she yeah. reacted. Um, so I, I think even she was just mm-hmm. like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is pretty okay. Yeah. 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 Um, the, the other parties. Uh, so, yeah, the, the three other parties or, well, one was an independent. But yeah. There was the People's Party, the Rhinoceros Party, mm-hmm. and the independent candidate. So as we mentioned, Terry yeah. Groom would put in his name three days before the deadline for putting yourself forward for the election. Mm-hmm. And so he wasn't didn't have as much time to ramp up his campaign. Yeah. So mostly people saw him at the all candidates meetings. Uh, in the Whistler one, of course, he did also leave. Mm-hmm. Um, he felt that he wasn't getting enough questions from the audience. Uh, and then the Rhinoceros Party is a, an older party, mm-hmm. but also a fringe party because they have never had a candidate elected. So they kind of revived around this election. Yeah. And our candidate in this riding didn't get elected. No, he didn't. But, but he had at least 200 people who... You thought he was the man for the job, yeah. Or at least felt strongly about what he had to say, mm-hmm. right? And then Doug Bebb, or Robert Doug Bebb, of the People's Party. The People's Party of Canada is mm-hmm. a new party, mm-hmm. so that was recently, recently founded. Um, but it ultimately was not successful. So that mm-hmm. basically wraps up but at, yeah. at the end of an era, the election is the finally election over. The election is done. Exciting. Yes. <laughs> um, one thing that was also really interesting is that even though they weren't old enough to vote yet, ah. a lot of the students in our school district took time out of their day at the schools to cast their own like ballots. It doesn't count for anything, but it is interesting to see what resonates with students, whether it's a uh, certain topic or a certain issue or if it's something that you know their parents have been speaking to them at home about Hmm. um so yeah so the results from the student election came in as well okay and in our writing the green party would have been successful one thing that is interesting is there were a lot of student-led and youth-led protests in squamish this year Mm -hmm. and the green party candidate was at one of them and Mm. so that might have resonated with them. The environment is something that a lot of people in Squamish care about very deeply. A lot of students have spent a lot of time this year protesting for climate action. Yeah. And so that might have been part of why they voted that way. Um, there was also, um, but in across Canada though, the student vote largely reflected their parents' votes. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it was it was, uh, it was liberal. a liberal minority as well? Yeah. So the Liberal Party would have won if it was just the students voting. A uh, seat count of 110 and oh. a vote percentage of 22.3%. Interesting. But instead of the Conservatives, it would have been the NDP forming the, the opposition. opposition. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting. Um, but it is worth noting that the conservatives while they took third place with 94 seats they did in the student vote win the popular vote that would be a government unlike we've ever seen before because with 110 votes you still have a minority you need 170 and if your opposition is the ndp Mm -hmm. the ndp have said that they've or at least hinted that they'd be willing to work with the liberals so maybe that opposition wouldn't even really be an entire opposition in that case yeah maybe that's something when these students are of age and can vote maybe that's something that they'll carry with them Mm -hmm. maybe their ideas will change who knows yes well that's a really good perspective uh thank you for that oh thanks for the students for voting yes an idea of how they feel (laughs) good job kids keep it up keep up the habit well into your actual voting years Mm -hmm. but i think it is also Mm -hmm. a really cool program like i Mm -hmm didn't know how to vote until I turned 18 and somebody told me how to check off a ballot mm-hmm. but I think it is a good practice for making sure that students know how if that is something that they eventually want to do mm-hmm. you get the habit in early and then you can continue it on when it becomes uh, something that really truly counts mm-hmm. it's a good idea overall I think The next thing that was 
quite newsworthy in our town this week was um, basically there was a climber, mm -hmm. uh, a local Squamish climber named Adrian Wheaton, and she made a first ascent. That's basically means that you climb a new route for the first time. It's like mm -hmm. no one else has ever touched it. Exactly. In the sport of climbing, like if you have a first ascent, it's something to brag about. Basically. Oh, big time. Yes. Yeah. So she made a first ascent, but not only did she make a first ascent, she did it under some pretty trying circumstances. Um, she is a, a fairly highly skilled climber who unfortunately had a pretty um, big accident mm -hmm. last year, last March. Uh, what happened was um, as she was falling, somehow the rope wrapped around her thumb and portions of some of her fingers. And when you fall and the force, uh, the full weight of your body goes down on it, that force actually severed uh, her thumb and mm -hmm. portions of her fingers. It was a pretty devastating accident. Mm -hmm. um, something that would understandably sideline anyone, uh, especially a sport like climbing when, when your fingers are, are so, so important. Mm -hmm. um, but she did something really remarkable. Uh, she still, despite having that injury, uh, she managed to make a first ascent of a route. And on top of making a first ascent of that route, since then, she has told the chief that she has been able to climb at a, um, not the exact same level, but a very similar, a very similar level, level, uh, basically the same level of difficulty, but mm -hmm. she just has to be a little bit more careful about the types of climbs that she chooses, mm -hmm. uh, because, um, if, for, for those of you who are familiar with climbing vocabulary, there are some holds where, uh, like called pinches, where you have to use your thumb. It's it's basically exactly how it sounds. You pinch the rock, stuff yeah. like that. So those types of, uh, of routes that may have those kinds of holds and anything else that you could imagine would require the heavy use of a thumb. Mm -hmm. She may not be able to tackle quite as well, but other routes which were of the same high level she was climbing before, uh, like crack climbs and stuff like mm -hmm. that, she is gotten uh, back on the horse, so to speak. And um, for all you climbing nerds out there, she's climbing at around 5'11 level. Um, and she uh, is sending she's them. She's currently climbing at 5'11 yes. level. Yes, uh, after like post-accident and everything like that, mm -hmm. and which is where she was, roughly about where she was beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, and making perfect fall-free ascents. Which on is those. In incredible, especially considering how recent her injury was. Exactly. And, and like, uh, to add on to the, the top of just actually physically climbing, um, the, the style of, tra of climbing that she does is called traditional climbing, mm -hmm. where you have these devices called cams and nuts that you put into the cracks of the rock, and it requires a thumb to deploy these because yeah. you have to you have to push a spring, basically. Um, so I don't, I have no idea how she gets around that, but she's managed to find a way to be able to, to deploy these devices. Mm -hmm. uh, and that adds on, obviously, a much harder layer because in addition to trying to get up the freaking rock, <laughs> you have to fiddle around with these devices and make mm -hmm. sure that you, you're you protecting your life yeah. correctly. Um, so mm -hmm. we caught up with her and uh, she kind of gave us a little bit of how it was like to take that first ascent because that was the stepping stone, the first major stepping stone to getting her back on uh, the road to recovery. Mm -hmm. So this happened a little bit while ago um, in last year, summer 2018. Mm -hmm. um, but we are bringing this up now because she was recently honored at uh, the Golden Scrub Awards. She's not the only person. There's lots of people that got honored. But she, mm -hmm. um, because it was such an extraordinary uh, first ascent, people wanted to uh, give her a shout out. Yeah, acknowledge how hard she'd worked and... How yeah. far she's come. Exactly. So here's what it was like making that first ascent. I cried at the top as well. I got up there and clipped the chains, and it was just bittersweet, I think, would be the best way of describing it. You know, mm. I was certainly happy to be back and doing that, but the bitter part of the bittersweet was just... Uh, how difficult that grade felt and how stressful it was to try to place cams and to clip beaners without 
a thumb, and so it was a weird combination of hope, I think, that mm. um, my climbing career would continue on, but also uh, kind of adjusting to the new new normal. And um, as per uh, climbing lore or whatever? Or, I guess or tradition. Con- tradition? Yeah. Or, yeah, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. As per the tradition... The person who makes the first ascent of a route mm-hmm. gets to name it. So, yep, she called it a uh, one thumb up. And I love the name she chose. The obvious is that I yeah. climbed it with one thumb. Um, it's sort of a, a play on rating, you know, whether it's a movie, a climb or whatever. We often say, oh, yeah, I give it two thumbs up, right? And so I would give this route two thumbs up, but I can't. I can only give it one. And I think the idea of um, moving upward as well came into uh, my mind when I was thinking of names for it. Um, Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be something light, too, you know, not not necessarily to make light of yeah. what happened, but to just say, okay, I'm okay with this, mm. um, and, I, you know, not that I'm obviously laughing about it, but I'm just, I'm okay, I'm more comfortable with it, and yep, I have one thumb, and so I think it was a pretty clever name, if I don't say so myself. Okay, well, she's definitely taken that in stride, her mm-hmm. situation for sure. And one really fascinating thing is that um, it's it's not super common, but there have been other cases of climbers who have uh, had pretty life-changing injuries as well. Mm-hmm. Um, some losing fingers, other limbs and whatever, and still making it and, and, and pushing through and, and still climbing at a Mm-hmm. high level uh so originally when she had that accident she was in the position of reaching out to some of those folks and being like hey you got any tips what can i do mm-hmm. but now um she finds herself kind of with the tables turned and what's incredible now is i've even had others reaching out to me who have recently had accidents and mm-hmm. so to now be on the other side of that and mm-hmm. able to tell them mm-hmm. Listen, everything's going to be okay. You will get through this. Um, is is pretty remarkable uh, mm-hmm. because a year and a half ago, there's just no way I could mm-hmm. see myself. You know, my life has it's just changed a lot. So, yeah. I guess at the end of the day, uh, humans in general, um, we can survive a lot. So yeah, it's it's a pretty incredible accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was definitely one of the the more, I guess, powerful things that I've I covered this week. It was yeah. it was quite something. Yeah, I I was tearing up when I was re- proofreading it before we put it in the paper. <laughs> it was it was really touching, and I think I think a lot of people in Squamish and elsewhere, obviously, can look at this story and you know know that even if things don't seem possible, that they can be. Okay, we're bringing it to our editor's pick with our editor, Jennifer Thuncher. She is here to tell us about the wonderful thing that she has chosen to talk about this week. Jen, what's going on? I always on? laugh at the beginning of these because our audience doesn't know you're just choking on a Chapa dog. Shh. Studio <laughs> Magic st- is choking. supposed to edit these okay, things Okay, he's out, not dead. That's but, the important oh, yes, thing. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> okay, it's carry very on. Hard. I almost died. Be serious. Almost died. Okay, yes, serious time. Uh, well, okay, so yes, what I was going to talk about was a story that we had this week about the Sustainability Production Forum, and that deals with the movie industry. Mm-hmm. So uh, first, a disclosure, my husband has worked in the film industry and post 
for 30, 30 years, a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and on his end of it, actually, a lot of the time, it's definitely much more sustainable than the newspaper business. They don't use any kind of paper that I can that right. I can tell. Yes. It's all digital now. But on sets, we learned from Zena Harris, a Squamish woman who has a business that helps uh, helps productions become more sustainable. And she also puts on a forum every year, and it's coming up on November 1st and 2nd in Vancouver. The district went last year, uh, the District of Squamish, and the district is going this year. So let's have a listen to Zena uh, tell us some of the things that film crews can do to reduce their waste. Um, the supply chain, so what products uh, are, are productions actually using, and how can we you know, influence that a bit in terms of You know, everything from, like, the little stuff on the catering line to, you know, the type of wood that's being used on set, Um, you know, it all has an impact. You know, that little stuff, um, you know, individually packaged condiments, for example, on the catering line just, you know, contaminate your recycling or your compost, right? There's no need for that. You know, buying in bulk. And then, you know, you think about the, the sets that are built, and, um, you know, what's really important is, um, focusing on a, a, a wood that the, the industry loves. It's called Luan, and it comes from Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. And these are rain, this rainforest wood. And so, uh, you know, A, maybe, you know, reuse uh, and a, a set wall that, you know, has already been built. That's the best thing to do. Or um, if you're going to build a new wall, get that stuff from, you know, a, a forest, forest Stewardship Council certified forest. Mm-hmm. which means it's responsibly managed, or find an alternative altogether. So that's, that's really interesting because, um, I mean, when we think of, like, pollution, we think about cars and factories and stuff like that, but you don't really think about, I don't know, your your favorite flick on the screen. No, and I think because we assume, we say for sets, I never thought about the wood that they would use. You mm-hmm. just assume they would reuse it, but it's a habit, right? Just like us, we print things off sometimes too often when we don't need to. And in Squamish, we do see a lot of productions coming into town. A lot mm-hmm. of um, different things have been in our downtown core and outside. So one of the things she said is if you see a crew, go up to them. I mean, make sure they're not filming, but you can ask to speak to the location manager and say, you know, I saw that you are picking up recycling or I saw that you, whatever, whatever you might see or ask, what does this crew do to be sustainable? Her other point was that municipalities like Squamish, they can also act as a gatekeeper and say, what's your plan for X? So for example, if you have a catering crew, what's your plan for the, the unused food? So each crew usually has a caterer that comes in for all the actors and actresses, but also for the people who work on the set. And often it's amazing. Anytime my husband's been on set, he won't eat at home after that. Oh, it's really, really good. Okay, it must um, be really, really, really good then. Okay, it's really good. Well, okay. I'm a bad cook, but that's beside the point. Uh, so what she said was, it is perfectly legal and welcome to pack up that food, put it in a sealed container, label it, and take it down to, say, in our case, Squamish Helping Hands. And some crews just aren't aware of that or weren't before she started doing what oh, she does. Okay. So you can ask, and the district could require um, strict limits that protect the environment. So aside of the environment, we maybe don't think about when we watch Netflix. Yeah, and especially important here because we're definitely a filming town. Yeah. We are. Hollywood North, the back, I don't know, I guess we're the backyard of Hollywood North. Hollywood yeah, North yeah. is is. The adventure capital of Hollywood. <laughs> ah, how about that? How there about you that? go. There, there you, you go. go. Ciao. Ciao. The Squamish Sound is brought to you by the Squamish Chief. The music for this episode was produced by Stephen Chua. Cover photo by Clayton Matthews. Have a story tip? Give us a call at 604-892-9161. Send an email to news at squamishchief.com. You can read these stories and more online at squamishchief.com, the newspaper, and have the news delivered to your door every week.